So last year, I did a first impressions video on Spy Family, the then brand new comedy series featuring a fake marriage and found family story set amidst the backdrop of a Cold War espionage thriller. And I was pretty positive about it. I was so positive about it that I actually convinced multiple people who, like me, had sworn off anime completely during the dark times of the 2010s, where weebs were practically controlling how the anime industry exported to the rest of the world to try it as well. The thing is, when I cover a show positively on first impressions, I have a 95% rate of eating my own words later. She-Ra turned into toxic relationships the series. I love you! I always have! I, and you were there? This is what you left me for? You, on the other hand, you're not looking so good. Hilda disappeared up its own ass with grim lore. Has Been Hotel was in development hell and being completely buried in controversy with a garbage spinoff. The Owl House's amazing pacing ground to a halt for the last 15 episodes. Moon Girl ended on a depressing cliffhanger. I just can't win. I'm a fucking curse. Why do I kill everything I touch? But Spy Family is the one time that didn't happen and I'm honestly thinking I graded it a little bit too high in the first impressions because it got even better and I have nowhere to go. Spy Family stands out as a rather unique story. One that doesn't fit into the narrow genres that weaves of Cran most anime into. I mean, its genre is technically listed as shonen, but like, tokenly? I actually can't think of any anime that's comparable to Spy Family, which is admittedly why it drew me in. The story is mostly about the personal struggles of its lead characters, the Forger family, set amidst the backdrop of the Cold War. The war itself isn't the main focus, usually forming most of the individual conflicts that end up detailing the characters. If you're the kind of person who really wants to get super deep into the world building and the history behind the war itself, well you can read history books on the actual Cold War. This show doesn't spend a whole lot of time explaining its own world history because it suffers from a terminal condition called being good. It ironically reminds me of Lisa the Painful, an RPG about abuse and trauma set amidst the backdrop of a post-apocalyptic world. The apocalypse itself isn't really all that important, it's just a device to put the characters involved into more extreme circumstances because they're all traumatized or on drugs. Explaining all of that would have just detracted from the personal story being told. The same is true here, the war provides opportunities for characters to explore their personal demons in a very satisfying and compelling way. All of them are decidedly anti-war, in part due to losing their families because of war. All of them are motivated by family, either having lost family, wanting to find a family, or wanting to keep what little of their family remains. And most of the good episodes orient around family in some way. What does war do? It destroys families, bish bosh. Ironically, the story is paced similarly to Steven Universe, where the average length of a story arc can be measured as We get there when we get there! There is pretty much no standard for this show in terms of how long a story will be. Sometimes everything is settled and complete in a single episode, Episode. Other times an episode will have three stories built into it Rugrats style, and other times we go into multi-episode story arcs where all the spy shit really starts ramping up. However, it does do something that I really fucking hate, and that's having absolutely no consistency between where an episode ends. There's a really cute scene where Anya snuggles up to Lloyd on the sofa, and for the life of me, I couldn't find it for the longest time, until I realized it was after the credits of the first episode. In season two, there's an episode during the cruise ship arc about Yuri getting sick that's really important to understanding the nuances of what Yuri's deal is? I went and picked a bunch of things that'll make you feel way better! Oh, sis! What the heck happened to you? Oh, I just kind of made some bees angry at me. I'll be fine. Oh, and I fought with Mr. Boar! We'll have hot pot tonight. But first, I'll brew up some herbal tea. This is bad. I'm afraid Yor might actually die if I ever get sick again! But it's buried after the credits of an episode that already ends on a cliffhanger with only the suspiciously long progress bar as a sign that something is up. And I'm just kind of accustomed to anime titles and credits being longer than a bald, bearded man's response to anything a trans woman says, so when the credits start, I usually close the player. There's another issue in that oftentimes text will appear on screen, but it's entirely down to where you get a particular file as to whether or not it'll even be translated. Getting the footage for this video, some piracy sites would actually translate the text and others wouldn't, and so so Google Lens has been important here because oftentimes important information is being conveyed through the text and a lot of the comedic timing relies on it. So it makes me wonder what the fuck the dubbing team is even doing. Yeah, I did have to dig hard to find those petty complaints. Anyway, Spy Family, like every good show, is character focused. So let's just get right into talking about the characters. Starting with... So we took them there and we told the tale how his midi-chlorians were off the scale. Our running theme in this video is going to be how characters end up being wildly different from their first impressions. From Lloyd going from a man literally too perfect to possibly exist, to a floundering goofball who gets owned by a literal BB, to Yor going from a droning pinup to the single funniest woman to ever grace the screen, to Yuri going from a walking cliche who I'm sure the internet will be very normal about, to having one of the most heartfelt moments in the series, to Nightfall who is also there. Anya's first impression is very different for as she ends up being characterized later on. In her first appearance, she's practically oozing precious out of her pores, like, oh, look at her, pushy baby. Don't you want to give her your whole world? I want to live in a castle. 
sure if there's one to rent. But throughout the rest of the series, she evolves into a full-time bastard and starts getting into all kinds of elaborate shenanigans and even takes advantage of the fact that she knows way more than she lets on to manipulate the adults in her life. Now I want this, Mr. Doggy. It's okay, he's big. You're being difficult. If you don't let me keep him, then I'm gonna turn bad and stop going to school. <laughs> But why would you do that? This is something people got really bitchy about in the early episodes, but I love this about her. She is a devious little brat. However, that doesn't preclude her being just a normal kid. One thing about shows that involve kids with supernatural powers is that they're often portrayed as far more mature than they're supposed to be. This is not the case with Anya. She barely understands half of what she hears in people's thoughts, and she's barely able to extrapolate from what she does understand. This is what mostly fuels the comedy behind Anya as she's trying really hard to help her parents with their missions, but most of the time she can't figure anything out because she's like, four years old. Because Lloyd is unaware of the fact that Anya can read minds, he's unintentionally put the pressure of his mission onto her. And Anya really struggles with actually achieving anything he needs for her mission. Her grades are terrible and she really struggles with studying and doing well in her classes, which means just the first step of Operation Strix is extremely difficult, especially with how much she realizes she's holding Lloyd's mission back. This is only made worse by Lloyd's own plan B to befriend Damien Desmond to find an alternate route into direct contact with Donovan. The problem here is that Damien is a spoiled, unlikable pissant and Anya likes him so little she doesn't even remember his name and keeps calling him second son, which in terms of expressing complete disinterest in a person is like mentally filing someone under friend B. But despite that, Anya goes to great lengths to try and make that work, and that's honestly tragic. The way Anya tries so hard to befriend someone who just treats her like garbage all for the sake of Lloyd's mission is kind of sad. No child that young should be going through that. In the comic, Anya actually gets her second Tenetris bolt by saving Damien's ass during an inspection. And it's not even that Lloyd expects her to do this. After Anya punches him, he kind of gives up on Plan B entirely. As far as he's concerned, Plan B was dead in the water before it even began. Anya is putting this pressure on herself, largely out of fear that if the mission fails, then she's going to go back into the orphanage. So watching Anya deal with the kind of pressure that would drive an actual adult crazy while simultaneously processing it through a child's understanding of that is both interesting and yanks at my maternal instinct like a grabby child let loose in a room full of server racks. This does actually get triumphant at times. During a story where the entire family is on a cruise ship while Yor is guarding an assassin's target, more on that later, Anya is actually on point when it comes to saving everyone's asses. She saves Yor's cover, saves her life, actually kills two assassins herself, helps the cruise ship staff uncover one of the bombs set to blow on the ship, and indirectly kills the guy who rigged them in the first place, and completely completely destroys Lloyd's entire soul. The entire arc is just one series of constant wins for Anya. This child has a fucking body count. Anya is also the subject of most of the comedy. Her comic misunderstanding of everything around her, the reactions she provokes from damn near every character, her reactions to the internal monologues of adults whose brains are more messed up than a cooking show for mind flayers. Come on and introduce yourself, Yuri. I think I got a case of heartburn. Could family life have changed Twilight's tastes? Does that mean there's a side of him I don't know about? A side he only shows this woman? This lady is crazy. Anya is either the funniest character on the show or the one driving all the best comedy, and that's admittedly the biggest strength of the series. The show is actually capable of some really tense and dramatic moments, and that's because the baseline tone is very soft and funny and domestic. One problem that has affected modern storytelling is that people have a tendency to only remember the dramatic or tense moments in a series, and the fact that those moments are the punctuation marks for comedy gets lost in people's memories. So there's a tendency to try to recreate those memories by recreating only the tense and dramatic moments, which results in these stories failing to land as effectively as their predecessors. Anya is practically incapable of allowing that to happen because she's a baby, and eventually she's going to put this mental image in your head, and any notion that this isn't a comedy is going to die faster than anyone left alone in a room with Yor. This is important as it really lets the tense moments, like Anya desperately trying to stop Twilight from opening a door rigged with a bomb, really settle on you. People acclimate to tone, and so when a series is mostly lighthearted, the con contrast of the dramatic moments really hits them. As I explained a few videos ago, when a story is all grimdark and all sarcastic eye rolling all the time, any impact of the moments that are supposed to hit you in the stomach is going to be blunted by the fact that you'd already been bracing yourself the entire time. In that sense, Anya is crucial to making the thriller part of spy thriller actually work. She's important to the mission both in universe and out of it. I 
I was pretty harsh on Yor the first impressions, deriding her as a comedy character and little else. And honestly, I take all of that back. It takes a while, but later episodes really go into how insecure Yor is about not being able to do what is traditionally viewed as wifely duties, as much as that phrase makes me want to gag, since this show takes place in the 60s and everyone except Lloyd and Yuri are on our case about it. There's an episode entirely devoted to her trying to learn to cook and only getting one thing right, and it's a big dramatic and triumphant moment for her, only for her to fail again immediately afterward because this show is fucking hilarious. But my favorite episode about her is actually the role of a mother and wife, where after several episodes of Yor feeling threatened by Fiona, genuinely one of the worst characters in the show, Yor completely breaks down about how, well, just play the clip. Of course you get sick of a clumsy muscle-headed woman like me. I'm so bad at all the normal lady kind of stuff. It leads to a really heartfelt scene where Lloyd reinforces that, who gives a shit, really? Everyone's good at different things, gender roles are garbage, we've done this twice before, but here it's a really tender, quiet moment, which, as you probably remember from my video revisiting Steven Universe, are the best moments in any story. And it was immediately preceded by Lloyd getting drop-kicked into the air by a drunk Yor set to a heavenly choir. So I say let's get married for the- God, when was the last time a story was this wacky, this funny, this ridiculous, and yet still so beautifully written that it yanks on your heartstrings like an elven cupid? I looked everywhere for you! Yor actually climbed to being my favorite character in the series because she's simultaneously hilarious, but her story is also very heartfelt and deals with insecurities that are born of a culture that just treats women like shit, and in the show as well. The best part is that this is based off actual history. During the Cold War, both America and the Soviet Union would use fighting the subversives as little more than a cudgel to oppress people who stepped out of line. And women who didn't hold up their domestic duties or who dared to be single were pretty high on that list right underneath any black person in the immediate vicinity. This was especially true in the Soviet Union. In America, women were locked to doing housework and child rearing. In the Soviet Union, women were expected to work and were locked to doing housework and child rearing because Vladimir Lenin was about as progressive as a time machine that can only go to the past. Yor has a very genuine concern that her being single and being bad at doing wife things might draw the secret police on her tail, especially since she's a fucking professional assassin. She has double the reason of anyone else to not want to draw their attention, and she doesn't actually know Yuri works for the secret police. So it's not just systemic misogyny messing with her head, this is actually a safety risk for her. Her fake marriage to Lloyd is the main thing keeping her off the government's radar and keeping her undercover. She has no idea Lloyd is playing along for a mission. She genuinely thinks Lloyd will drop her if she's bad at all the normal lady kind of stuff. This even happens in a comedy skit where she tries to get Anya's gym clothes to her, only for Anya to not have gym that day, and because she didn't notice that, she starts thinking she's a bad mom. Even an inherently silly premise is used to inject a little bit of heart into the story. It's not all like this. Season 2 opens with an episode where Yor's been shot in the ass and is in a bad mood because she's in pain, and Lloyd misunderstands it and really is just comedy all a rap. I spent a lot of time caring for my brother or working, so I rarely had much of a chance to have fun. That's why everything you did today made me really happy. If you don't mind, I'd love to do it again sometime. Oh, never mind, I'm fucking crying again. I don't even know what I was thinking here. The premise is Lloyd wants to take Yor out so she can relax and enjoy herself to show appreciation for all the work she does. Of course it was going to make me cry. What I especially like about this is that every time Yor starts doubting herself, either Lloyd, Anya, or Yuri will immediately reinforce that Yor is the single coolest person who ever lived. God, just imagine having three people in your life who just fucking adore you and cherish you like this. Then we come to the embarrassingly named cruise ship arc, which is actually centered primarily on Yor. For the first time in her career, she's given a job to safeguard life instead of take it. The head of a mafia family and his sons get whacked, and she's tasked with protecting his late wife and her youngest son. However, Anya and Lloyd will also be on the cruise because Anya won a raffle. This means not only does Yor have to protect the target, she has to keep her secret from the family. Luckily, she gets Anya's help with that. Wow. The lady from the circus is so unbelievably cool! Oh, it's just a performance! Anya really saved me just now! And as a bonus, she doesn't even seem to recognize me! Throughout the entire arc, Yor ends up having a crisis about whether or not she even needs to keep doing assassin work, given that she only took the job to provide for her brother, who doesn't need her anymore. Financially, anyway. <laughs> 
So Yor becomes increasingly doubtful of her own reasons to continue doing this, up to the point where she's dying after being tossed around by someone who can actually match her in skill, and also another high heel malfunction. But this concludes with Yor realizing why she's here in the first place, to protect someone whose only crime was getting caught in the crossfire, just like her and her brother were. It's at this point Yor realizes exactly what retiring to a quiet life would cost everyone. I didn't mention it too much last time, but the backdrop of the entire story is a war between Astania and Westalis that was so terrible that both countries conduct extreme amounts of espionage purely to keep another war from heating up, which is difficult given the amount of terrorist cells in both countries desperately trying to heat it up. There's not a single character in the main cast that isn't affected by that war in some way. Lloyd lost his mother in the war and it motivated him to being a spy so no child would ever go through what he went through. Yor and Yuri lost their parents and Yor ended up having to raise her brother, which is the prominent reason Yuri's so weird about her. Even Anya was experimented on by an organization whose only currently known goal was world peace, in a staggering example of people forgetting why they're supposed to be fighting for peace in the first place. This organization tried to steal Anya's childhood from her in the name of peace, forgetting that the war had already stolen enough childhoods. I've heard a lot of people say they want this story to conclude with both Lloyd and Yor quitting and having a quiet life to themselves, but a big part of their characters is that they are constantly battling against that selfish desire to quit and settle down, to say to hell with the rest of the world and do something for themselves. The both of them are so good at what they do, they make the world a safer place on their own. Just on the micro scale, think of all the lives that are saved when Thorn Princess is sent to take out a terrorist cell instead of sending in, like, a platoon. Twilight is consistently ending wars before they even happen, with only Frankie for support most of the time. The fact that Wise overworks him becomes a plot point multiple times. Yor can't just quit. It's punctuated at the very end of the arc. Oh, little Graham wants to get a good bite up too. I don't know, my hands are all sticky because of the blood and stuff, I... Your hands are the reason he'll live to see the future. This whole arc is really good. It had started to grate on me with just how long Yor's monologues were, but the ending really made up for it. Yeah, I was wildly off the mark with Yor last time. She's such an interesting character. Both Yor and Yuri are quite compelling on their own, and we'll get to Yuri in a bit, but they become really interesting case studies if you've read about the historical and psychiatric context around them. That's when their characters burst open like a freshly dissected brain. Actually, on reflection, I think I know why I had such a bad first impression of Yor. It takes a while for Yor's character to really settle Early on, it seems like Natalie's reading her lines off her own frontal lobotomy, and Yor is talking and acting like she's on 40 Benadryls, monotonously whisper-talking to everyone. Then in later episodes, she's practically hamming it up. Excuse me. Vice Minister Brennan from the Auditing Department, I presume? Terribly sorry for the interruption. But tell me, may I have the honor of taking your life this evening? I can't tell him. I can't say, oh, I'm just in intense pain because I was killing a bunch of terrorists and one of them shot me in the butt and not expect some follow-up questions. I mean, I treated the wound, but ow! See, this is why I can't watch this shit subtitled. Who in their right mind would want to miss out on this? Also in the subtitle version, Yor keeps calling Anya Miss Anya, and that's just weird. It takes a while for Yor to really reach peak emotional gut punch and peak wacky nonsense, and once she's there, it gets really good. This also extends to the really sentimental moments. An early episode has Lloyd give a monologue about how he respects sex workers, because Yor is accused of having been one, and she just blushes a little. A later episode has the same thing happen, but she's all teary-eyed and her nose is running and their love theme is playing, and it's just all the good goofy shit. Yor in the early episodes feels like she just exists to be a deadly pinup doll, whereas by the middle of the first season she's delightfully cringe. I guess it took the creator a little while to sort out what he wanted to do with her, and hey if it works, it works. She's equal parts girl boss and girl failure, like Commander Shepard, right down to being able to drink fatal poison and just get a mild headache, and Yor is arguably even more of an hilarious mantis lady than she was before. For absolutely no reason at all, here's a clip of Yor hissing. Actually, speaking of, you know who else got funnier? I can be in different places with my many funny faces in disguise. I don't know what the hell happened to Lloyd, but in the second season, he is completely off his tits. He is always misreading every situation, oftentimes letting his imagination get the better of him. The episode where Yor gets shot leads to him floundering so hard as he thinks Yor is unhappy and tries in vain to improve that with a date night. 
Granted, it does work, you or did have a great time, but that's only after she drinks enough fatal poison to kill the pain. <laughs> then, during the cruise ship arc, Lloyd starts overreacting and thinking things like not buying Anya a toy will jeopardize the mission and bring the SSS up to him, which is the kind of logical leap that Anya herself would make. Especially when Anya is overthinking one thing and Lloyd is overthinking another thing into a terrible logical feedback loop and who himbo fied this man? I think that kick might have done some real damage. I know my tone probably sounds like I'm angry. I'm not. That's just what I sound like. I'm trying really hard not to laugh. <laughs> This does lead into the single greatest moment in the entire series, as Anya realizes Lloyd is overthinking everything, and uses that to get him out of the way to give your cover. You just don't understand, Papa. Uh. The reason people go on adventures is so they can do fun, exciting things. But you are not excited at all, Papa. <laughs> if you're gonna be that way, it'll make me super sad. You need to start dressing and acting like a guy that wants his daughter to be super happy all of the time! Finally got it right. Anyone who sees me will know I'm a fun and very cool father. You're so uncool, it hurts. I can't believe Twilight got destroyed by a literal BB. <laughs> Furthermore, Lloyd is able to clock Yuri as a member of the secret police just based off the price of a bottle of wine, and yet Yor hides the fact that she's a jacked demigoddess of spite and rage about as well as she hides her drinking problem, and Lloyd's just like, huh, well that's weird, and thinks nothing else of it. <laughs> Love truly is blind. Sometimes it's hard to tell if that man is actually a genius or a fool. Granted, Lloyd hasn't shifted entirely. Later on during the cruise ship arc, he actually reminds the audience that he's cool as shit when he diffuses the entire ship that that's been rigged to explode, and actually manages to get a handle on Anya's bullshit. Furthermore, he continues to be a very sweet and kind father. He always dresses up his softness as being necessary for the mission, but Twilight is a lot more sincerely kind than he gives himself credit for. That's about it for Lloyd, honestly. Lloyd is arguably the straight man to every other character's bullshit, and throughout season two, he's largely taken a back seat because most of the season so far has been taken up by Yor's arc on the ship, which is fine. This series is playing the long game, if the comic is any indication. So let's move on to... Love me, love me. I fucking love Yuri. He's terrible, which means he's amazing. The first impressions ended when the dub reached the episode where Yuri comes over, and I remember in the video pointing this moment out. What do the two of you like to call each other? Um, I call her Yor? Yor! But that's our thing! And laughing at how much of a weirdo Yuri is being. And that stood out because a bunch of weebs jumped into the comments section to go, That joke doesn't translate well because in Japan, you only use someone's name on its own to show an intimate relationship with them, which explains why Yuri is freaking out. But to every jackass who jumped into the comments to point that out, Yuri is freaking out because a term of intimacy is being used by yours... SPOUSE! See, the joke translates perfectly because no matter which way you slide it, Yuri is a fucking wackadoodle. He's a freak in every language. There's no reasonable basis for this kind of behavior. And we know this because in the very next episode... Um, when I grow up, I really want to marry you, okay? Aw. Well then, better grow up soon. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting. <laughs> Yeah, Yuri's kind of fucked up, but I actually find his character compelling. There's something about people whose messed up childhoods have completely miswired their brains that makes me go, I hope you get therapy. It gets more interesting if you do some reading on the subject because, and I know this will chill you to the bone, there are a lot of kids out there like Yuri, and they all follow the same template of being socially isolated and their sibling being their only real source of any genuine emotional intimacy. Now, emotional intimacy is important for a healthy relationship with a sibling, but when they're your only source of it, aka no friends, no parents, or cruel parents, wires are gonna get crossed in a kid's brain as this one person forms their entire love map. And that is literally Yuri's entire life. Both their lives, actually. Yor is also fixated on Yuri early on, but more in the sense of making sure he doesn't worry about her and using him as an excuse to continue doing assassination work. Yor's fixation seems to be on Yuri as a kind of surrogate son, with her taking some time to accept that he's left the nest. Well, mostly. But her emotional independence rapidly grows as she spends more time with Lloyd and Anya. Yuri hasn't gotten to that point and is largely avoiding doing 
doing so. Funnily enough though, and I actually mentioned this in a previous video, this is a really easy problem to solve. If Yuri just gets some emotional distance from Yor, makes some actual friends, and stops orienting his entire life around her, he'll actually get over these feelings very quickly and have a more healthy dynamic with her. But that takes a degree of effort and willpower that most people in Yuri's situation just aren't willing to do. They either stew in self-hatred or they stew in rosy daydreams. People in the former category tend to act like this is the end of the world and they're permanently damaged in some way, but they're really not. Unrequited love is the easiest mental health problem to solve, even in these cases. The interesting part about Yuri is that the story doesn't treat him like a joke or some weird authorial fixation. I mean, he is the butt of the joke a lot, but usually for his emotional instability. You're given enough context that you get why he's like this, but it's always made apparent that the ideal conclusion for him is to get over his feelings toward Yor and move on to a healthier place in his life. His co-workers say that out loud, even. You need to get over your sister so you can concentrate on your work. Yuri actually gets an entire episode dedicated to his work in the SSS, and it's here where his character really gets to shine. Yuri is only part of the SSS because keeping war from breaking out in Ostania is the best way to keep Yor safe, and he's obsessed with that because Yor would always come home covered in blood or bee stings. But it's here where his fixation on family really shines as he's surveilling a suspected traitor selling fake propaganda to Westalis news media, only to learn that his target just wants to give his family a better life. Furthermore, when his target blackmails several children with the secret police to keep quiet, Yuri is visibly outraged that he's dragging children into his racket. But in spite of that, when the SSS goes to arrest him, not only does Yuri offer him the small dignity of not being arrested in front of his father, he even goes as far as to put the man's father on financial aid. I'll put in an application for your father to collect some financial aid. Thank you. Yuri didn't have to do this, and admittedly it's a small courtesy, but it speaks to the fact that while Yuri follows the SSS's scr <laughs> SSS's script, oh god, that's awkward, but it speaks to the fact that while Yuri follows the secret police's script to the letter, he does sympathize with a man he has to arrest. At present, Yuri is a very divisive character, because his incestuous attraction toward Yor is a pretty strong mark against him, and often leads to him acting out in some pretty extreme ways, usually in his internal monologue. Why would I ever help from a guy like you! I'm going home! If you make my sister cry a single tear, then I'll have you execute- No, no, no! If I'd done that and it picked up on the sound of sis making those kind of noises, I wouldn't be able to handle it! Why are you even here, Forger? Go back to work! Yuri, when will you finally learn to get along with Lloyd? Never gonna happen. Say the word and I'll execute Lloydy on the spot. Good lord, that man needs therapy. And some think this detracts from his work with the secret police, but I'd actually argue against that. Despite the questionable way his mind gets there, Yuri's family-oriented motivations envelop everything he does, even his work with the secret police. The man who fought against the government? Or their loyal lapdog? I wonder who'd be called pathetic. It's easy. The one doing something harmful to his family. I'd never hurt mine. Despite his obsession over Yor, he never acts selfishly about it. He's just really emphatic. People bring up his hatred of Lloyd, but if I'm being honest, I think anyone would be suspicious if their sibling went, oh yeah, I've been married for a year and just forgot to tell you or invite you to the wedding. Even to a normal person, that would be peculiar behavior. And especially to someone who spent their entire life watching their only family keep coming home covered in blood. And, well, he's not wrong. Lloyd is up to something, the marriage is fake, they are hiding that from him, and Yor is behaving very suspiciously. That's something that becomes more apparent later on. Yuri is specifically trained to spot and capture spies and notices something is off almost immediately. He grills Lloyd with a lot of questions early on because he's certain something is up, and he's right. Something is up. He does end up begrudgingly accepting that he doesn't have any proof Lloyd is doing anything, and so keeps his opinions to himself from that point on, save for when he and Yor are alone. Why don't you come over for dinner? Do you mean it? You know, I probably shouldn't. Lloydie's gonna be there, and I've still got a little work to finish up. So many audio transcripts. Yuri, when will you finally learn to get along with Lloyd? Never gonna happen. There's a world of difference between his internal monologue and the things he says and does out loud, which changes the viewer's perception of him, but it speaks volumes that he keeps most of this to himself. Sure, his feelings are strange, but he channels them in ways that are, objectively speaking, very selfless. It's not fair for me to depend on you for the rest of my life. At least not as much. 
You can't really separate this from Yuri because it informs his beliefs, his decisions, and every scene we see him in, both the positive and the negative. That's what happens when this makes up your formative years. And honestly, Yuri is sympathetic enough that I want him to get to a healthier place. That's what the good ending looks like to me. It helps that Yuri is genuinely funny, and the joke of his feelings towards Yor don't crop up nearly as much or as severely as some people seem to think it does. I've seen characters like Yuri that were so shallow and dull, I was left thinking, I hope you get a meat cleaver to the neck so we don't have to listen to you anymore, and I don't get that vibe with him. I understand why someone would think he's the worst character in the show, especially as this type of incestuous attraction toward a sibling is weirdly common in certain genres of anime, but I was harsh on Yor and she managed to surprise me by turning into the best character in the show, so I'm gonna give Yuri a chance to surprise me in the future. I could be a better boyfriend than him I could do the shit that he never did Up all night I feel like I'm about to earn a brick through my window for saying this, especially after saying Yuri was compelling, but Nightfall is the single most boring character in the entire show. Nightfall is introduced for one episode, one arc, and one half of another episode, and the only driving character motivation she has is her obsession with Twilight. Okay, Lily, but Yuri's obsessed with Yor, what's the difference? The difference is there's an ocean of psychological backdrop to Yuri's obsession with Yor, and it actually splits off into interesting aspects for him as a character. Nightfall has none of these things. She's just obsessed with her boss and determined to get to play the role of his wife for Operation Strix. Everything she does is done in the name of making Twilight realize they're perfect together. You don't even get the sense that she cares about making the world a safer place, like every other character in the fucking show, even the baby. She's out here just to hope Twilight notices her. Nightfall is almost interesting, particularly at the end of her debut episode when she realizes that Twilight actually has real feelings for Yor and leaves, but it's underwritten almost immediately. Every episode she appears in afterwards has her reinforcing that she is determined to break up this family. Her love for Twilight is completely selfish. There's not even any consideration given to what he would want. She's out to prove herself as if it's a foregone conclusion. Compare this to Yuri, who puts himself in more danger just to make the nation a slightly safer place for Yor to live in, and despite his rather obsessive internal monologue, asks nothing in return other than for Yor to remain a part of his life. And while he doesn't like Lloyd, he begrudgingly accepts the fact that Lloyd isn't going anywhere, and even in his most recent appearance at time of writing, he manages to be in the house without so much as a hostile thought. Fiona, on the other hand, can't stop being catty and passive-aggressive to Yor, and keeps challenging her to weird displays of dominance, which she keeps losing. And there's something of a joke made about the fact that Twilight wouldn't dare leave on Anya alone with Fiona. The one time they're in a room together, Fiona immediately imagines beating Anya with a whip. In truth, when it comes to both these characters, you can defer to Anya's reactions. Anya recoils from Fiona at every opportunity, and actively says she's crazy. Meanwhile, she just gags at Yuri's internal monologue, but otherwise actually likes him. If Fiona had more things going on than just her obsessions, or if those obsessions weren't so pitifully surface level, she might be more interesting. Now, it's worth pointing out a policy of mine, and it should be yours as well. Never blame the character character for the writer's failure. When writers drop the ball with the character completely, pressure should be on them to pick up the slack. When writers fail characters, it's common for fandoms to start reviling the character as if they were a real person, and that's always a bad call. I've seen some truly terribly written characters in the past, and I have always stressed the fault lies with the writer. Holding any emotional grudge against a character the way some people have done in the past is just irrational, so I would hope that the creator can at least do something with Nightfall eventually, and it's a little concerning that more effort was put into Yuri than was put into her. I have no idea how the comic goes in this regard, maybe they already have done something with her, but every time she shows up, I'm gonna have to brace myself for the possibility of secondhand embarrassment. While there is an entire cast of kids at Eden, it's only Becky and Damien that get any kind of significant time in the spotlight, and that's largely because they contrast each other in their relationships with Anya. Becky is the daughter of some big arms dealer and becomes fast friends with Anya, largely in part due to Anya using her as a way to get out of trouble. It's during her friendship with Anya that Becky actually comes out of her shell, as she'd apparently been hostile with the other children and thought herself as being above her peers, until she met Anya and all that melted away because, as we've established, Anya is hilarious. Becky's friendship with Anya is one of the sweetest things the series has to offer. It's a shame we don't get to see more of it. One of the best episodes of the series actually ends with an aside of the two of them going shopping because Becky erroneously believes that Anya is capable of tolerating Damien for longer than the time it takes to knock him 20 feet into the air. And the really touching moment is when Anya is exhausted from how difficult the whole ordeal was. Becky seems to think Anya isn't having fun, but it turns out Anya was having fun because it's her first time out with a friend. Like with the previous story with Yor, it's just a really touching moment as someone who isn't accustomed to just having their presence appreciated 
is experiencing it for the first time. Becky is used to having to put on a face for others, but Anya cuts through all of that with, yes, this one, I like this one. Later, the idea that Anya might be moved to a class away from Becky forms the drama behind a game of Old Maid, and the best part is that if you're old enough to remember a time before ubiquitous social media, you know that kids just being moved a hallway away from each other can destroy their friendships completely and utterly. This was the case in the early 2000s, it's especially the case in the 60s. Children almost entirely rely on proximity to form the majority of their relationships. Hell, it was only Lloyd's intervention that got her near Becky in the first place. It also highlights just how much Anya cherishes her friendship with Becky. Sure, she's primarily motivated by not wanting to be alone, because hating being alone is the fundamental aspect of her character, but Anya has other friends, tentatively at least. It's Becky specifically she doesn't want to lose. Hell, she doesn't even think about how being moved might affect Lloyd's mission. Anya's friendship with Becky is just delightful. It's the only time any of the stuff at Eden College is bearable. Most of the stuff at Eden is about as interesting as watching paint dry on growing grass, but when it's just Anya and Becky, it's great. Everything about them is, uh, well, almost everything about them is perfect. A minor thread running along in the background is Becky developing a crush on Lloyd. Yeah, sure, kids get puppy love crushes all the time, but the way the show hangs on it is just fucking weird. The only time it's even tolerable is when Becky pretends to have gotten drunk and you're actually panics thinking she might have accidentally drugged a child, which you know, is something Yor would probably do, and sprints Becky to the emergency room, and even then it's only tolerable because we get to see Yor at her wackiest and see Becky deeply regret her actions. Oh, you alcohol poisoning is an extremely serious matter! sure what kind of doctor you need to see. It looks like you need the emergency room. We also get to see Lloyd being absolutely struck dumb by how strong his wife is. Here goes. First try. First try. First try. First try. First try. First uh, you're. Don't get the wrong idea, Lloyd. I used to be the apprentice of a professional so at least this episode has that going for it. So even at her most nauseating, Becky at least proves to be the vehicle for something fun to happen. The same cannot be said of Damien, whose personality is like a child borrowed an iPod from the world's most boring man and decided to base his entire personality on the playlist inside. Like Becky, his character is based largely around being a spoiled rich kid who thinks he's better than everyone. Unlike Becky, that's it. Damien's noxious personality proves to be the primary obstacle to Twilight's friendship scheme, as Anya can't be around this kid for longer than five seconds without wanting to deck him. Even when Anya is making an actual effort, all of her efforts are undone by Damien's inability to not be on his bullshit for five seconds. Granted, it does make for excellent conflict, but it also means every time Damien is on screen, I just roll my eyes because it means I'm about to watch Anya get verbally abused, even when she's doing her best to be nice. I don't need to eat that, you dummy! I can still become an Imperial Scholar if I just work really hard! This stuff is for stupids like you! What the? I know people will say, oh, he has an obvious crush on Anya and screams at her because he can't handle it. I don't care. That trope is noxious, especially in a show where, even at their worst, people express their love by being inordinately kind. The lone saving grace is that nobody is having any of Damien's bullshit, with the exception of his two simps. Even Anya responds to his biggest outburst with confused disgust. Like, this is bad even for him. If it weren't for Lloyd's mission, Anya wouldn't even bother glancing in his direction. Which is why it's all the more bizarre to see the fanbase shipping these two. This is probably the most egregious example of fandom brain just latching onto the only available ship in the room. You could ship literally anything else in the series, with the exception of the things that are literally crimes, and it would make more sense. You could ship Yor with Nightfall, or Yuri with the guy he works with. Actually, those two would be big cute, not gonna lie. But Anya and Damien? No way. No how. Now, I know what you're gonna say. Oh, Lily, are you really gonna put that kind of judgment on a six-year-old? And you know what, viewer? Yes, I am. Now, Damien does get one good moment, and that's in the episode First Contact, where Lloyd intrudes on a moment between Damien and his father. It's the first moment of genuine emotional motivation for Damien, which is something every character is defined by, and seeing Damien without him having to interact with Anya and get hyper-aggressive is a bonus to his character. It's the first time I actually felt for Damien, as he tangibly just got a little bit of that fatherly approval he so desperately craves. Actually, no, that's a lie. There's one more in the episode Damien's Field Research. This one is another episode where Damien is seen without Anya or Becky around, 
around, and you see more of his friendship with his two cronies. Emil and Ewan are portrayed at the start like a Crab and Goyle type, but later on it's actually shown that their friendship is quite genuine. Here, when Damien gets in trouble for oversleeping, the two of them also get in trouble purposefully so they can help him with his punishment. And the rest of the episode is just the three of them bonding over different kinds of detention. This is good! More moments where Damien can just be a kid without having to scream his head off at Anya would be great. If there's anything to take away from this video, it doesn't take much to make a character work. There's one more thing I want to bring up before we go, and this came about as a result of a conversation with my good buddy Zero Zero Ren, a positively brilliant and talented person who I would literally murder someone for, but she mentioned the fact that they don't really ship Twyor like everyone else and even the show, and they had this to say. I just don't see it really. Her reactions to him are exaggerated, yes, but to me it doesn't read like romance or a desire for it. It's more like she's looking up to Lloyd as a pillar of normalcy in her life, and she's afraid of losing it. She doesn't know what normal means, and she kinda knows that her behavior is unnatural and weird, and Lloyd, on the contrary, is able to fit in any society and be respectable there. Like, he's getting all A's in being a person in society, and she's only ever gotten C's, so his approval means a lot to her. It's validating and comforting. And naturally, she's afraid of losing it from him, of losing his respect, and she's afraid of him thinking she's a space alien, and that's how her reactions to him hit me. We went back and forth on this a bit, and I found myself really vibing with her thesis. Now yes, the show is obviously going the romantic route, and I'm under no belief that it isn't going to end with Twilight being stationed in Desmond's circle long term, and the family staying together, and he and Yor likely falling in love. Everything about the story has been going in that direction. But after talking to Ren, I find myself leaning more into the idea of platonic co-parenting. Ren is right in that Yor's reactions to Twilight are extremely exaggerated, and she's never really had a normal relationship with anyone of any kind. Even with her brother as a combination sibling and parental relationship, which was the only significant relationship she had with anyone for the longest time. She says it herself almost constantly. And it doesn't seem like she had any real friendships before Lloyd, so going from completely socially isolated into a platonic co-parenting situationship causes a sort of social overload and she has no idea what to do. On reflection, I'm glad that Twilight trying to take advantage of Yor's feelings for the mission ended in disaster, because honestly, doing that to someone in Yor's position just feels gross. In truth, Yor's friendship with Twilight has helped her come out of her shell and develop more friendships with her co-workers and put more passion into her real job. So the idea of the two of them staying married, but being very close and intimate friends is something I honestly find far more interesting. It really emphasizes the found family aspect of the series by showing that family really can be anything. Going the romance route just makes it a very typical nuclear family, which is on brand for the 60s, but still. Granted, I know this won't happen. The general public, even today, is so skittish and so touchy about non-romantic relationships having any degree of emotional intimacy. You need only look at what adults do when a young boy so much as glances in a young girl's direction. Close friends who are really affectionate are often called in denial, and the only accepted form of intimacy you can have with a friend is friends with benefits. And even then, most people expect you to either eventually stop or eventually start dating. So as fun and heartfelt as platonic marriage and co-parenting sounds as a concept, I know it's not going to happen, because it's going to make way too many people way too cranky for no reason. But make no mistake, it would be big fucking cute. God, I could just go on and on. But as I'm writing this, I'm finding it increasingly difficult to structure this mess. So just, j just go. Go watch Spy Family. It's the best cartoon I've seen in a long time. Even the shit that sucks is still funny. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. You, I love you, I love I figured that was my only chance to say anything, so I did. Crumbly girl, shake it, fabby girl, shake it, fabby girl, shake it, fabby. Crumbly girl, shake it, fabby girl, shake it, fabby.